Holly Cotton here, and I am so excited to share our guest story today. So I have Brooklyn McClinn, and Brooklyn is, okay, first of all, if you're looking at Brooklyn, yes, he looks familiar. I'm about to give you guys uh, some of some respect to put on his name when I start telling you some of the places that you've seen him. But not only is Brooklyn out here uh, inspiring us and, and showing that you can follow your passion and be successful, but he also has a very unique story about heart health, because you guys know I'm always talking about as a nurse, we, what we got to do, I'm, I like to bring awareness to things that people don't even know about, especially minority communities. So I cannot wait to share all of the great things that Brooklyn is doing. So welcome, Brooklyn. Hey, what up? What up? Thanks for having me. Okay. So like I said, if you guys say, hmm, that man looks familiar. First of all, you probably have watched Bel Air uh, on Peacock. <laughs> so Brooklyn is part of that series, as well as, let me just tell you guys, Bel Air, you've probably seen him in Marvel's Cloak and Dagger, Blackish, uh, Amazon Original Goliath, Parenthood, NCIS, CSI, New York shameless rules of engagement tyler perry's the have and have not so we just know we talking to somebody that's out here doing the dang thing so <laughs> i love all of that i love i love that so brooklyn whenever i find people that are successful at doing something i always want to know how you got on this path because i know that you didn't just walk outside today and start acting like you this is something you've been doing for quite some time so how did you find that acting was your passion and how did you get in this field i i wish it was a more interesting story um i have i have a basketball background um so i played uh college basketball i played a little bit uh overseas and like taiwan and mexico and I didn't find it to be uh, very exciting to play over in those areas. It wasn't as glamorous as I thought it would be like the NBA or some of the higher end leagues in Europe and stuff like that. So the money that I was making, I was like, bro, you can make this money working a regular job at home. So um, from there, um, I had a buddy who was a prominent actor and we had met playing basketball and he said to me, actually, I went to him kind of confused. I was 20, 25, trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And he asked me a very simple question. He said, what can you do? And I said, I can play basketball. And when I was a kid, I used to be pretty good at acting. And he goes, okay, well, won't you try acting for five years? And if you don't like it, do something else. And I was like, okay. And literally it was, it was just that. And I started doing it and just being, um, a studious person, uh, being a Virgo, just very like driven, determined. Uh, I don't do anything that I don't go all in on. So once he, that suggestion was brought to me, um, I made it a point to like really try to understand, uh, acting, the business of acting. Um, and that's pretty much how I got started. I was kind of a natural. I uh, worked early on in like commercials when I first got started. So I thought this was easy. And then I had a couple of theatrical auditions where they was really talking about paying me some money. And that's when I realized, oh, this is not a game. Like, this is like some real stuff. And to truth be told, my first really, really big audition, I bombed. Like, I was, they was going to give me $25,000 an episode and... I went in there nervous, anxious, and just basically bombed, like as, as bad as you can be. And I went, took that experience, and I told a couple of friends that were more experienced than I was about it. And one friend in particular, Tasha Smith, who's a very prominent actress, director, um, she was like, have you ever taken an acting class? And I was kind of like, what's that? <laughs> I was like, aren't people in the acting class not getting jobs? Like, why would, I don't need an acting class, I'm working. And she was like, boy, if you don't get your butt in acting class. And I went and I was like, oh my God, like I need this. So what class teaches you is, it teaches you how to sharpen your tool and your craft and really have an understanding of technique and fundamentals. So when you're in those kind of pressurized situations, 
you have your technique to rely on as opposed to the external conditions of being nervous, people watching you, people judging you. So um, I really committed myself to that. And from there, you know, I've pretty much been okay. Okay. First, let me just rewind because I'm a Virgo too. So okay, I know. <laughs> we hard, hey, why we are we, we hard headed, but we going to get it oh done. Oh my gosh. But Brooklyn, why are we always the winners? Like when I tell you, like, you're not going to stop me. Like there is no, when I, when I have it in my head, there is no determined. Like, it's like, Oh, okay. That didn't work, but I'm gonna yeah. figure it out. So that right there is the whole point. We figured out why you're successful as Virgo. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that you did say that because I get people, when I tell you like this whole life coach thing that I'm doing now, the first thing people are always asking me about is, well, how do you find your passion? Cause I'm, I'm always saying it like, find what you're good. And you, no, I don't say find what you're good at. I always say, find your passion, what's your purpose, what's your why. But now I'm going to steal what you just said, because that was the perfect thing. What are you good at? Yeah. What, what are you good at? So I love that. I love that. Now, I also want to ask you, because there are so many young people right now that are trying to act. Obviously, you can look at Tubi and you see that <laughs> acting. Hey, I ain't hating on it. Tubi, if you listening, holla at your girl. <laughs> I ain't got no acting experience, but hey, I, I, put me up. Anything but a stripper, I'm, I'm, I'm good for. <laughs> They're going to be mad as hell when I get up. They're going to be like, you know what? You just be the bartender because you, you, ain't, <laughs> you ain't got the moves. But, you know, you do have like these younger people. And I know working, especially with Bel Air, because that was like a mix of, of, of a young millennial class, um, cast as well as some of the younger actors. So whenever people are looking at you, what do you want people to take away from your story of success that are maybe trying to get into the field? Um, well, like we just talked about understanding the importance of studying your craft. Um, two, my father told me a long time ago, um, he said, there's only two reasons why people don't make it. Either you quit or you die. And that really, it really struck a chord with me because I was like, those are two things. One of them I can control at least. You know, we don't know, we walk out the house, anything can happen, but me putting forth an effort, me not giving up, me just being resilient, um, I can control that. Like nobody can stop me from that. So um, that's those are my two biggest pieces of advice. Just don't quit and, and study because everything, most things in life are learned behaviors. So, you know, success leaves clues. So you see people that are doing certain things. Um, you know, somebody's written a book, somebody has a workshop, somebody has a podcast, somebody has the answer to what you're trying to do. You just have to be willing to go seek it. So don't quit and just study. I Okay. I love that. I love that. Got it. Yeah. Cause some of the people I'm just like, mm. <laughs> like you look at some of the, and I love, I love, I love, oh, FYI, I followed you on Instagram because I was like, oh, I'm not even following him on IG. But Instagram, when I tell you, I like Instagram is such a, uh, like where I get so much content to talk about because <laughs> it's so yeah. funny, but they meme the hell out of Tubi movies. Like yeah. they'll, they'll have something where the person gets shot and then they're like, oh, you know, and yeah. just fall over. It's <laughs> yeah. No, it's, I mean, here's but, the thing. It's like. I think the conversation starts with you give them props for doing it, right? Mm -hmm. As bad it is it as it is, they did it. So I think mm -hmm. you have to remove the fact that you did it off the table. Because obviously the fact that you're doing it, you want it to be good. You want to mm -hmm. improve, you want it to get better. So um so any joking about it is is after we've already acknowledged y'all did it. Whether it was one person, two people, you and your homies, you and your girl, like whatever, y'all shot it, y'all did it. People, it's available for people to see. Now, obviously you want to improve as you do it, mm -hmm. which is where the comedy comes in or, the, or the, the criticism comes in. Cause it's like, yo, like you can't see the microphone hanging in the shot. <laughs> like 
All right, you yeah, you did it, but let's get the boom out the shot. Let's Do it a little bit better. Continuity. Right. Let's make sure we're wearing the same clothes in the same scene. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. So yeah, no, no, no hate to anybody that's doing anything mm -mm. creative. But it's like at the same time. You know, you want it. You want it to get better. You want to do it on a more mm -hmm. professional level. You want to keep raising the stakes as you go along. But nobody can can fault for trying. Definitely. No, and I ain't hate no Tubi. Testing, testing, Tubi. Call me. <laughs> I, I will. I will. I will come in. I will do whatever y'all want to do. Put me up. Put your girl. Hook your girl up. No, I'm just uh, kidding, but not kidding. Right. Um. So. <laughs> But I, I do, I know exactly what you're saying because I feel like when I started, so when my podcast first started, you know, I was on Ebony Podcast Network, which is part of Ebony Magazine Publishing, blah, blah, blah. It's a whole long story. But when I listen to like some of my first episodes, when I look at my, you know, like how I looked, when I looked at production and, and then I was like, but I was doing it. Yeah. And there are so many people that started a podcast a, a year, a year and a half ago, like I did, and they might only have five episodes or they never had anything interesting or it just fell off or whatever it is. So I'm always like, you know what? I have people reaching out to me now to want to be on my show. So it's like, you have to improve. But had I just given up or had the first time I couldn't figure out how to edit something or whatever it was, that was the obstacle of the day, then I would still be back there. But yeah, you know, but we're Virgos. Anyway, mm -hmm. I digress on the Virgo season. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, when is Virgo season up? Because I'm sick of hearing you talk about Virgos. I'm like, don't be a hater. Don't be a hater. Um, so what I kind of want to do now is because, like I said uh, to you guys, Brooklyn also has a story that has to do about health-wise. And, you know, I always, as a woman, as an empowering woman, I always want to bring a highlight to women's issues. So we always talk about women's heart health and how heart disease in women, especially African American women is always a silent killer. But we never really talk about the men because you just automatically assume men know if you're fat or you're obese or, you know, if you, if, if you're not, uh, if, you know, if you don't, can't walk up a flight of stairs, there's probably an underlying cardiovascular issue. But I know for you, Brooklyn, that wasn't the case. You, you, you didn't have that. You were, you were still fit. You were in shape. So can you tell us about your story about how, what one, what, what your heart problem was and then all the surgeries that came from, from finding that diagnosis. Yeah. So, um, my, it starts with my father. So my father, uh, passed away at 49 from a heart attack. Um, so when I was young, you know, I remember there was a lot of conversation about cholesterol and, you know, I have a ring around my eye. Um, that's directly related to cholesterol. So when I remember being really small and it was just starting to form itself, and as I got older, the ring went all the way around. So the whole phrase of the eyes are, are a, a look into your soul and the doctors, you know, look into your eye, they can actually see what's wrong with you in your eyes. So um, for me, cholesterol was an issue, but I was always told diet, exercise, diet, exercise, mm -hmm. um, I don't smoke, don't drink, you know, all right, cool. I can control that. Um, but it never really seemed to help my situation. Now, always been active, basketball, lifting weights, all that kind of stuff. Um, so for me, I just thought, you know, let me just stay on, let me just stay active, stay in shape. But there was a seed in my consciousness of, well, this could happen to me. So if it does, I'm going to be in shape. Like I always had a thought of, it's not gonna kill me. If I gotta cross this bridge, it's not gonna kill me. My father wouldn't stop smoking, wouldn't stop drinking, wouldn't exercise. Um, so ultimately he died from you know, a heart attack. His mother, my grandmother died of a heart attack. She was a smoker, she was a drinker, right? Overweight. Um, so for me, my only question was, why is it happening now? So when it started for me, it was 2016, playing basketball, ironically enough, felt some discomfort in, uh, I would say, like at the base of your sternum. Um, but I 
naively thought my heart was more to the left of my chest because, you know, pledge allegiance to the flag. You know, right? So I never knew my heart. Which is always a common right? misconception. Everyone thinks that. They're like, what? Yeah. The apex is in the middle? Right. When you're doing CPR, right. that's why people are in the yeah. middle. So mm -hmm. come to find out my heart is pretty much in the center of my chest. Um, center left, to be specific. But um, so if I had known that, the discomfort I felt, I would have been like, more, oh, that could be a heart issue. So I was thinking indigestion. I was thinking a stomach problem. Um, so continue to play basketball, even though I initially felt the initial discomfort, I was just going, as a dude, we just going to power right through it. N nothing hurts me. I'm just going to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, I would say maybe 45 minutes into the episode, I still um, was feeling discomfort and playing basketball. I was just like, you know what? Let me stop. I started running errands um, and the pain, because I stopped running and the blood flow was slowing down, I started to feel more discomfort. Um, in retrospect, it was, you know, my artery starting to clog because when you're running and your heart is pumping, blood is flowing through. So I wasn't really feeling the pain the way most people would have. But once I started slowing down, my heart rate's coming down. Now the, the clot is starting to clog up the arteries. I'm feeling more pain. Um, once my left arm started going numb, maybe an hour or so into it, I was like, oh, that's a problem. Like, right. <laughs> drove myself to the <laughs> hospital. And by the time I got there, the pain was probably like a 10 and collapsed on the floor in the lobby area. And they got me up, uh, gave me a nitrate. The pain started to subside. And the doctor was like, you're having a massive heart attack right now. And ironically enough, I got really calm because I was like, that's what this is? Like, I had no idea. I thought heart attack it comes, you drop, you die. Like, I was like, I've been for the last hour and a half. Like, that's what this was? Like, and he's like, yeah. Right. And now the double-edged sword is because I was in such good shape, more damage was done to my heart. So because I didn't get attention right away, because I could withstand so much pain, more damage was being done. So the doctor that very first day was like, I recommend you get a heart transplant. And I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, I was just playing basketball this morning. Like, how do you go from that to needing a new heart? So were they saying like it was ischemic, like the oxygen wasn't getting to a certain part and it had died? Okay. Um. Mm -hmm. So... I just couldn't wrap, I couldn't conceive what the doctor was saying. So I left out of there like, nah, I'm gonna get back in shape. You know, I, you know, cockily enough, like, you know, I knew it wasn't gonna kill me and you know, I'm, I'm gonna beat this mm -hmm. thing, right? So right. Um, the doctor was kind of like, all right, man, but your heart is enlarged. Like your valves are leaking, like it's a problem. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a overcome this thing, right? So being a Virgo. Right. So. Right. I was about to say, because you do not ask for help. Like, you're going to figure it out. You're like, you know what? I, yeah, let me go to YouTube how to do a heart surgery, because I could probably man, do it myself. Let you tell it. So <laughs> from there, and the story's so long. So from there, um, was on medications um, and around two so 2016 may i had actually just booked the, that tyler perry tv show so i was in atlanta filming came home for the weekend had the heart attack couldn't go back to the show so i was just, that's another thing so as an actor when you really do get a good opportunity like for to have to let it go because of a health thing i was just like man why is this happening to me now um yeah because it's not like a regular no. job where you have pto and FMLA, like that's a career. In, that's really like entrepreneurial world. If you ain't working, you ain't exactly. getting paid. So, um, so 2017, um, I'm functioning, but you know, clearly not a hundred percent. My kidneys are starting to suffer. Mm -hmm. Other organs are starting to break down just from overcompensating for my heart being so weak. Um, I ran into a buddy, um, who, said he was having similar issues with his valves. And he was like, hey man, but I went to this doctor at this hospital, they fixed it. And I was like, oh, they 
I didn't know you can fix it. You know what I mean? So he was like, yeah, you need to get in contact with this doctor. So fortunately, I was able to get in contact with uh, Dr. Starnes, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon over at USC Keck Medical. And they performed an open heart surgery, um, which oddly enough, like they take your heart out of your chest to operate on it, you know, put it back in and sew you back up. So I had an open heart surgery in 2017. The surgery lasted for about six weeks before my valve started leaking again. So in January of 2018, I had to go back and do the surgery again. So two open heart surgeries within uh, five months, which is really traumatic for your heart. Um, in between those surgeries was probably the roughest patch um, cause I probably was 130 pounds, you know, not able to work, not able to sleep cause your valves are leaking, which means the blood is regurgitating back up your neck. Um, had, you know, suicidal thoughts, you know what I mean? Just like, this is my life and I don't want to live like this anymore. You know, um, had the second surgery, um, was better, was able to get back to work. Not so much, you know, physically being able to get back. Um, 2019, 2020, we're in the pandemic, October, 2020, I have a second heart attack. Um, but this one was a little different. This one just felt like, you know, rapid heartbeat, um, sweating like profusely, but losing consciousness. Like I felt really sleepy and the paramedic comes and he's just like, man, you got to keep your head up. And I'm like, man, I'm so tired. I just want to go to sleep. And he's like, nah, you don't want to go to sleep. Like, you're not going to wake up. Right. right. I was about to say, <laughs> all the time. That's why you got to keep keep patients up. Like, I, oh, yes. Our, that's The ER was too stressful for me because that's exactly, they would, everybody wants to go to sleep. And it's like, you can't sleep. You can't sleep. Yeah. You might not wake up. So the thought I was having was, well, this doesn't hurt. So if I could go to sleep, I could just be done with all this. Like, nobody can't say that I didn't try. Mm -hmm. I've had two open heart surgeries, you know, just, it was so much going on, you know? So anyway, so I'm, they get me up on the gurney. The next thing I remember is it felt like we hit a speed bump. So I'm sitting up talking and they're talking to me, how you feel? And I'm like, you know, just bummed out. Cause I'm like, man, you know, I've been having heart problems for about four or five years now. And they're kind of looking at me like, oh, okay. So we get to the ICU. The paramedic comes in the room and he goes, you, you sure you okay? And I said, yeah, man, I told you, like, I've, I've been having these heart problems. He goes, no, you flatlined on the way to the hospital. So we had to paddle you to bring you back. So I was like, oh, so that what I thought was a speed bump was them hitting my chest with the paddles. So he was like, man, just, you know, try to take care of yourself. And I, so he leaves and I'm just sitting there by myself in a pandemic because you can't have any visitors. And I'm like, wow, I really just died. Like, okay. So then the revelation for me was, well, Brooklyn is dead. Like, so the fact that I'm still here is like, is nothing but God, right? So God is like, do I have your attention now? And I was like, you sure do. What do you want me to do? Because I, I ran out of strength. Um, so from there, it was, I, get, I got a pacemaker, and then they were strongly recommending the heart transplant, which I still was hesitant to do um, because I didn't like the idea of someone else having to die so I could live. Like that really bothers me, right? So um, if it wasn't for my mother who basically pleaded for me to do it because I'm like, I'm okay with dying. Like I'm not really tripping. Not like I want to just walk across the street and get hit by something, but I'm like, you know, at the time I was 47, 48, and I'm like, I've, I've done well. You know what I mean? So if this is my time, so be it. And she was like, you sound like your father. But I was like, oh, man, don't hit me with that. You know what I mean? So she's like, just do it for me. So I went in there and waited during the pandemic from October 2020. I got a heart transplant January 31st, 2021. Um. I suffered a stroke during the surgery. So when I woke up, I couldn't move the left side of my body and I'm left-handed. So that was a little freaky. 
my kidneys were failing. So they had me on dialysis. You know, my liver was swollen. My spleen was like, my organs were really shutting down. Um, and, you know, by the grace of God, the heart started to respond, start getting proper oxygen, proper blood flow. My kidneys responded. You know, my other organs started coming back around. I had to stay for two extra months to rehab, to learn how to walk again, to write, you know, because I basically was paralyzed on my left side. Um, left out of there. And since then, to be honest, it's just being an athlete, like you know what you have to do to get in shape. And as, as cliche as it sounds, it's one foot in front of the other. And so that's just what I did. And now we're here in, you know, pushing October 2023, two and a half, over two and a half years since. And uh, I feel great. Like, it's, I'm, I'm glad she talked me into it. Um, so for me at this point, it's, it's less about what Brooklyn wants to do and what God wants me to do. So anything that I do at this point is divinely led. I don't move unless I hear from God first. And that's yeah. just kind of so, you know, still being allowed to act and still being allowed to do certain things. Um, I have guardianship of my, my baby nephew. He's my grandnephew. Um, his dad was not really able to take care of him or the mother. So I took him at like two weeks old. So to be alive. Oh, I thought that was your son. I mean, son. he is, but he's. Oh, well, yeah. okay. I, right now. Well, I meant like, a I thought that you no, had. He's not. Um, yes. So, yeah. So I, you know, I took him and, you know, he's, he's, he's probably, I probably need him more than he needs me because he just gives me mm. that much more motivation to do things outside of myself. So. If it's the foundation, if it's just acting, if it's just being of service to people, like I really watch him and am inspired by him and encouraged by him to just take advantage of this time. Cause I never thought I'd live to see 50. So to be gracefully 51, you know what I mean? I'm just kind of like, well, I guess I'm gonna be here for a while. So let me take advantage of this. So. Right, right. Well, I and I I wanted to also just uh kind of sidebar about about that too because I know um if if this is the first episode that you've ever heard of of my show, I am a breast cancer survivor also. And so I, I like I just I resonate so much with the things that you were saying because that's sort of how it is. Like you have this this whole thing where you're going in life and you think that you're like indestructible. Like you're just like, ain't nothing wrong with me. I'm working out. I look, I always tell people, you know, when I got diagnosed, that was whenever the the DVDs were popular and I was insanity. I was P90X in. I was, you couldn't tell me, no, I was doing pull-ups every day. I could get a good 15, 20 pull-ups in. And so, and then, so for me, whenever they told me that I had cancer, I was like, I was like, me? I never even smoked a cigarette before. I don't, I don't even drink alcohol. Why am I the, you know, and, and so you go through that and then, and it's that, that rough period or whatever. But then when you come out, I always say that that made me figure out what my why was, because there is a reason why I'm not one of these women that have all, and, and again, I've met hundreds of women because I am a huge cancer advocate who have passed away. They've gotten breast cancer again. They've done some. So there's a reason that I'm still here. And sometimes that's how it is. Like you you get this loop-de-loop, -loop, all windy road to find your why. And so you just said that, you know, all of this giving back, everything has to do, like you wouldn't have found that why had you not gone through what you did. And also you wouldn't have appreciated doing that why. And I think a lot of times people, they might know that they have a passion or they, they are, they're like, oh, this is my purpose, but they're not all into it. Or it's not, all, it's not, you know, I, I got to go all into this. But when you know that you almost died, it's a yeah. whole, <laughs> it's a whole different yeah, appreciation. You know, I, I saw a pastor say, um, everybody's given a dream at birth. Like you're a little kid, you have dreams. Like you might not be able to articulate the dream, but it's a feeling like you have. And he goes, but what God doesn't do is he doesn't give you the blueprint to your destination. Mm -hmm. And he goes, he doesn't because if you knew what you had to go through to get to that destination, you probably wouldn't want to go. <laughs> so 
I say that to that say, part, like, that I've part. always been somebody who I feel better when other people feel better. I like seeing other people. So mm -hmm. that's kind of always been my thing. But it's like, God is kind of like, all right, bro, you got to go through some stuff. Like, because, yeah, you, you got the information, you have the awareness, and you're doing it, but you're not including me enough. So I'm going to have to send, send you through some stuff that you probably not going to like to get to where you feel like you're supposed to get to. And I'm like, and I, right. that was such a true statement. Cause I'm like, if I had a known, I wouldn't wish what I went through. And I'm sure you, you might be the same. I wouldn't wish, I don't have any enemies, but I wouldn't wish what I went through on anybody. Cause that shit was hard. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm like, right. if I knew I had to go through that to get here, I probably would be doing something mm -hmm. else, to be honest. Like, I wouldn't wish that on no. That was rough. I say the same thing, though, Brooklyn. I'm like, you know what? Okay, God, I heard you. You want, okay, you want me to m be more into being the change, helping people. You ain't had to give me cancer, though. Like, you ain't had to go. Like, that, that was extreme, God. Like, come on now. You could have just, right. you could have just did something simple for me. <laughs> mm, that's not how the game go. We didn't have to go all the way. Like you went with yeah. the big guns on me. That wasn't right. No, right. <laughs> but I, I totally, that that's a great analogy that you gave. And also before we talk about, because all of that, they always say that you fuel your purpose by pain. So that was the pain that you went through. And now you are using that to do all of this with, with the, the event that you have coming up. But what I just wanted to also ask about is because a lot of people hear about transplants and they hear about a liver transplant or a heart transplant. And so are you, are you I'm assuming you're on medication yeah. and, and things like that. Can you just tell people, because I like to share that as well, because when people look at you now, they're like, oh, you got a transplant. You good to go. You back in the streets. You can do whatever. But they don't realize that, no, just because you got a transplant, you're on medication to make sure that your heart doesn't, re uh, your body doesn't reject this heart. You have all of this stuff. Give us an idea about your daily regimen of what you go through, you know, yeah, post-transplant. So, which is interesting because I think the first question I asked was, is there ever a time when my body just accepts the heart and they said no. So that means medication for the rest of your life. Um, so the medications are anti-rejection medication. And basically what it does is it lowers your immune system. So your body doesn't fight the new organ. Um, so I don't, the medications, I take a blood pressure medication, even though I don't have high blood pressure, but it's just so the heart is not at any point overworking. Um, mm. But that's, I mean, those are the main ones, basically anti-rejection medications. Um, I was on prednisone for a while, but I don't need it anymore. So it's not as many as it used to be. Um, a lot of vitamins, because a lot of the medications pull nutrients from your body, um, which is interesting. Like, like you want to be healthy, but the doctor's, don't want you so healthy that your body starts to fight the organ. It's like, which is really interesting. So um, there's some, you know, anti-rejection medications that I have to take. You know, obviously we should be taking vitamins anyway. Um, diet wise, mm -hmm. uh, you know, stay off the salt, you know, leave the uh, salty snacks alone. You know what I mean? Like basic stuff that we should be doing anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. The um, basic I just stuff. continue to do. Right. right. You yeah. know, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no judgment, but you know y'all ain't doing right anyway. You know y'all ain't doing yeah, right. right. Leave that Popeye's so, alone. <laughs> and it doesn't mean you can't dabble every now and then, but um Right. Yeah. In so, moderation. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And just you know, I've always been an athlete, so working out as a lifestyle, it's not something like I need to get in shape or something. So it's just something that I do to, to maintain mm -hmm. and feel good about myself and make sure the heart is strong. So back playing basketball and stuff like that. So well, be I good. Just well, I just wanted to just give them a reality of, of what you are too, because like I said, you know, you're doing this, your <laughs> uncle daddy, 
uh, I see the, sh- I understand the significant, I was going to ask you if that was that your brand, but yeah. now I, now you gave us, gave us the story. So I ain't got to talk about it, but, um, but you know, they see you looking great and they don't realize that this is a day to day fight. This is not something that you had one time and, and okay, I got a heart transplant and I'm going like for the rest of your life. This is something that, like you said, you have to do every day. And I think when people see you and they see you achieving things and doing stuff, they forget. Cause it's the same thing for me. Like this month, September and October is huge for all of this breast cancer stuff. And people will forget that I'm a a cancer survivor. And then all of a sudden I'm on a show or I'm doing something and then I bring it up. And then I'm like, yes, I don't talk about it every day of my life. Like it was a chapter, it happened, but it is something that I will deal with for the rest of my life. It's not who defines me. That was chapter, you know, 36. Now I got 8 million more chapters after that, but it's still a chapter and it there's a chance that I can get cancer again. And just like your heart, like you said, it's an everyday thing. So you have to live that day to the fullest because you don't know how many days you have left. So I love that you're able to share that with us. Now that goes into how you're inspiring people through the power of your, is it a nonprofit nonprofit or is it? um, It's called what the heart wants and it's a wellness organization. And it's one of those things where, like we talked about earlier, it's not, it's something that I never considered doing. It was a a suggestion that was brought up to me. And I was like, that sounds right. That, that feels good. I said, but I don't know how to do it. (laughs) And the guy that brought it up, he was like, he introduced me to Barry. He's like, well, she can help you. And I, so we talked and. She's been instrumental in helping me get this thing off the ground. But it's literally like, whether I know about it, can do it myself or not, is irrelevant at this point. Does it feel like it's something I should be doing? So and I'm like, yeah, that's all I need to know because then I know God is gonna place the, the entities in front of me that help tie this thing together. So that's where it was birthed out of and Um, So basically, it's just about bringing awareness and information to underserved communities, because a lot of this stuff is is preventable, Um, especially in, you know, the black community, uh, men primarily, because we don't go to the doctor. I, I, you know, like a dummy, I let my health insurance go because I'm like, I don't need it. I'm good. Look at me. I'm strong. Like, and (laughs) so... You, you ain't see right? how many squats I just, I just uh, made. So, like, come on now. <laughs> I think, I think the most troubling part, but I get everybody has their own path, which gives me some kind of resignation to it. Is people still are gonna go through it? Like, even though you went through what you went through, I went through what I went through, and we can tell people about it till we blow in the face. Some people are still gonna have to go through it themselves and not take heed and not learn from somebody else's experiences. So that's kind of frustrating a little bit because I have family members, I have friends that are kind of like, you know, should be doing something about it. And I'm like, y'all just watched me be the most in shape, get broken all the way down, and I'm back in better shape than y'all are over the same span of time. Like, what what are, what are y'all doing? You guys are waiting for something to happen to you for it to be real. And I'm like, that's really unfortunate. So what I'm just trying to do is if we can help one person, two people, five people is just, you know, share the information. You know, we're trying to do health screenings at the walk, you know, blood pressure checks, EKGs, you know, little mini echoes, just so you can actually see what your heart is doing and where you are. Cause it's so important because we feel a certain way, but then what's going on on the inside could be something totally different. So what the tell them for because I do audio and, and visual. So someone might be on the treadmill or driving in their car listening to my podcast. Cause when I first saw it on, on your bio, I thought it said what the hell wellness. <laughs> I thought it was and then I was like, oh no, 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 it's WT <laughs> That's and there's hilarious. another H in there. So I was like, oh, it's not what the hell. Okay. Um <laughs> what, so this is the, tell what them the, the, the website for anyone. That- <laughs> 
I did because it popped up on my phone and I was on the treadmill. So you know how you don't, you just, your mind just already uh, processes it or whatever, which is good because once you give them the website, they'll never forget it. What the hell you want foundation (laughs) is trying to help people. That's hilarious. Um, So what what was the question? (laughs) I said, (laughs) I said, I said, spell out the contact information, the okay. website, the link, because you do have an event as well. And then okay, how so the can foundation is what the heart, H E A R T, wants. Uh, and the website is W T H W wellness.org, where you can find a lot of the information. And Saturday, September 30th, is World Heart Day. And so I'm having my first annual Healthy Heart Walk at the Redondo Beach Pier from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, if you would like to support, we'd appreciate it. There's ways you can do it on the website. You can donate um, to the cause. What else? Um, Instagram, uh, Brooklyn McLean. Um, I have links on there. Uh, it also has its own Instagram page. It's WTH. W wellness, uh, on Instagram. What else? Uh, yeah, I, it's, it's really interesting because every 20 seconds, somebody in the world has a heart attack. Every 30 seconds, somebody dies from a heart attack. Like literally we've been talking for 40 minutes. That's a lot of people in America. You know, every 30 seconds, somebody dies from cardiovascular disease. So it's a real problem. And I just feel like a lot of it is preventable. You know, at the very minimum, just diet and exercise for most people. Um, And I get how income and and economics plays a part in it because, you know, you got to eat. So and it's wild that eating healthy is more expensive than eating shitty. You know what I mean? So. Oh my gosh, I just complain about it because every, so every like, especially for my birthday, because my birthday, I always say, you know what? I want to look the best I've looked all year for my birthday. I want to do whatever I'm, you know, I'm going to take my bikini or a photo on the beach. Like I want to, I, I, whatever. So I go and I I'll only eat like a uh, whole, uh, whole foods, um, nothing processed, like everything. And it's like $200 a week yeah. just for reg, like just for food. And I'm like, you know what? Let me buy me a pack of hot dogs. Yeah, for I mean, And that's what cents. happens. Un- unfortunately, <laughs> that's what this. happens. Like, I, you know, CJ is, is 19 months now and he's never had juice, soda, ice cream. Um, but I've seen kids his age literally pushing strollers past each other. And that kid is eating flaming hot Cheetos. Like, and I, I can't even be like, Hey bro, what you doing? It's like, maybe that's either one, either you don't know, which is fair or two, that's what your you know, economics allows to happen, which is unfortunate that it's not universal that we can all eat healthy, but there's money in sickness. There's money in medication. So that's just unfortunately mm-hmm. the world that we live in. Yes. Well, I'm always talking about the conspiracy theory because me being a nurse, I'm like, mm-hmm. and I work for an insurance company as well. Yeah. So I'm like, I see, I see all of it. And I'm a nursing professor. So then I got to go teach the new nursing students about the conspiracy. So when I tell you I'm all about the conspiracy theory and I'm like, it's money in keeping you sick. There's more money in keeping you sick than it is to heal you and cure you. So, oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much, Brooklyn, for sharing your story. Of course, everyone is going to watch you. Now everybody's going to go Google you and, and, and they're like, oh my God your boy from Bel Air. <laughs> so not only that, but he's got a ton of other things that he's got going on, but not only that, but I love what you're doing, Brooklyn, because it's so important for us to be the change. And I definitely think that that is what you are doing now. And like you said, sometimes it's, it, it's not the way you wanted to define your purpose, but it sounds like you found your purpose yeah. the long way with the loop de loops, but it's here. So I love that. So thank you, Brooklyn, Thanks for, for coming on and sharing you. your story.